And welcome everybody to our Thursday night digital discussion. My name is John Harry. I'm the Programs and Marketing Fellow at the Milwaukee County Historical Society. Thanks for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, we have a really fantastic presentation coming up with Molly Dubin, the Curator of Jewish Museum Milwaukee, uh, that pertains to some of their items that are actually at the Historical Society uh, currently. So, um, so we're happy to be collaborating with them, not only in our exhibit, but on this program tonight. Uh, before we launch right in, we'll let everybody get kind of logged in and settled. Um, just some announcements for the Historical Society. We are open Monday through Saturday right now. Um, we do have all the safety procedures in place. Um, we had a mask policy before the, you know, before it was a, a mandate as a county building. So we have, uh, plexiglass up and, uh, sanitizer everywhere and everything gets wiped down on a frequent basis. Um, so uh, if you want to know more about what we have going on, I'll go to milwaukeehistory.net. Um, our current summer exhibit is about Milwaukee politics. It's called Better, Bigger, Brighter, 150 Years of Milwaukee Politics, obviously, uh, with uh, the DNC in whatever form it's going to take. It's, uh, we, we figured that now was a great time to have that exhibit. Um, and next week's digital discussion, a week from today, on Thursday night uh, is going to be about Milwaukee's socialist past. Uh, we have the uh, producers of the PBS documentary that just came out, uh, Mike Goucher and Lynn, Lynn Spragers. Uh, they'll be uh, on talking with our curator, Ben Barbera, about uh, the socialist history that uh, was in Milwaukee. Um, so that's coming up next week. So uh, again, you can find that on our Facebook page, Twitter, whatnot. Um, and we also still are lucky enough to have the exhibit that I was just talking about called Revealed Milwaukee's Unseen Treasures is up, uh, which features a lot of different pieces from all around Milwaukee County that we are, are just really uh, grateful to have, uh, as well as have on loan from us, but like from places from like uh, the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee. Um, and so two of those are actually more than two two stories come out of those pieces. Um, and I'm gonna let uh, Molly talk more about those uh, in tonight's uh, program, collection stories, Adolf Rosenblatt and Jack Marcus. And I will uh, I'll let you take it away. Uh, Molly, uh, we'll do a Q and A at the end. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the comments. But Molly, it's your show. Terrific, thanks so much, John. It's great to be here. And you have such an amazing exhibit going on right now. And what a great idea to, draw from the diverse breadth of collections in the many museums around the city. And we're uh, thrilled to be part of Revealed and to have a number of items from the Jewish Museum's permanent exhibit, um, excuse me, permanent collection on loan and on display there. And of course, one of the amazing things about collections is the stories that they tell, um, you know, you always kind of wish you could talk to an artifact or that an artifact would speak to you. Um, it's kind of the idea, I think the same thing of when you're kind of walking in a outdoors area where they're very old trees and you could just wish to have the conversation with those trees and everything that they've experienced and seen. Um, and I think so much is true for the artifacts and objects and collections as well. They all have significance and they all have a unique story to tell. And the objects are really imbued with those narratives. Um, and tonight I'm really thrilled to talk about uh, artifacts and artworks that um, come from two individuals, two men who I uh, was privileged to know in life, uh, just wonderful men who are no longer with us, but have left legacies, um, both in terms of everything that they left through educational endeavors, through their stories, through their interactions, and of course, through the artwork and artifacts that we are going to share. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit about Adolf Rosenblatt and Jack Marcus. So Adolf Rosenblatt, what an amazing, jolly, creative human being. Um, so we did a retrospective in 2017 called Moments and Markers. And Adolf, who has, you know, who had worked for decades and just had this prolific outpouring of creations, um, really uh, took a turn in terms of his health and um, passed away a couple months before this 
exhibit came to fruition. Um, so it became all the more important to celebrate his legacy. So I just want to start off with a, an image here and then we'll go back and do a little bit of background. But um, Adolf is standing here in front of probably one of his best known large scale installations, My Balcony, uh, which is actually um, the old Oriental movie theater filled with people that he knows, his family, his friends, his students, um, and really showing the everyday moments in life, the human condition, which is really what Adolf was all about. So um, we're going to move forward here by stepping back in time a little bit. So there's a, a young debonair Adolf. Um, Adolf was born in 1933 in New Haven, Connecticut, and his parents were immigrants from Lithuania and Romania. And his father had um, immigrated to the United States in 1912 um, and was able to then bring his family over. And they got going by uh, starting some businesses with fabric scrap ends called mill ends. Um, and I wanted to mention the, the fabric and immigrant connection because those both will connect to our discussion about Jack Marcus. So I'm gonna linger on this uh, first image here where we just give a little bit of background. So um, Adolf was not a fantastic student <laughs> growing up, which uh, later came to light that he had a, a problem with dyslexia that was really not um, diagnosed till much later. But um, even though he didn't do well in education, he had an early um, talent as far as drawing and creating things. And this was something that his mother took note of and really encouraged and got classes for him. So once he got through middle school, um, high school, and then actually went to one year of uh, college, University of Connecticut. And his father decided he wasn't really doing well in school, but you know he had this amazing talent, helped him put together a portfolio and took him to the Yale School of Art. <laughs> uh, gutsy move, and he was able to get a meeting with Joseph Albers. Joseph Albers, of course, um, very well known for his studies in color, his homage to the square. So another interesting connection between this story and the next is that, so Joseph Albers, who was the head of, of the Yale Art School at that time, was there because he had fled um, Nazi Germany. He had been working at the Bauhaus, uh, the very well-known school, um, which ran during the Weimar Republic and the Nazis came and shut that down because they felt that so much of what was going on there and being created was degenerate art. So he and his wife, uh, Annie, wound up moving to New York and that's how he wound up at the Yale School. Albers immediately recognized Adolf's talent, let him in, kind of amazing. He had some incredible years of working closely with Albers, becoming friends with him um, and a lot of his circle and kind of prominent intellectuals, artists of the day. Um, and that absolutely influenced Adolf. So he started off really in abstract painting. And this is an example of an early work. This is construction site. And I wanted to show this because Adolf is really known for his sculpture, his very gestural sculpture. But you can see here, looking back to this image, that it influences how he approaches clay. So he painted these large canvases with a palette knife and you can really see the layers and, and you can even get it, I think, through the screen, even though you're not in front of it, but you can see that dimensionality. Um, and that really kind of was a natural segue, that kind of build up and dimensionality to moving into working with clay. Um, he also did work in bronze. He did a few pieces in bronze and I'll, I'll show you one of those, but um, I wanted to talk about clay 
uh, because he got into that at a time when really clay was not considered kind of the top echelon, if you will, it was really on the lower rungs of, of the fine art world, as was portraiture. And both of those he wound up incorporating really into the majority of his life's work, um, which comes really when he, primarily after he comes to Milwaukee. So he winds up after, you know, spending time with Albers in his circle, he moves to New York. Uh, he has some early success with galleries there. Um, he's being influenced by kind of uh, the pop art scene and people like Andy Warhol who are taking everyday objects and changing that notion of how they're perceived and, and what would constitute the subject of art. And you can see that here in this work as well. This is a construction site. So uh, definitely some um, abstract expressionism going on, but we've got, you know, this is a work site. This is a work site. He's encountering, you know, hard labor being done, people at work, and that's something that, that translates as well. So, He's in New York doing well in the 60s. Uh, he winds up being offered a position at UWM here in Milwaukee. So 1966, he loads up the car with his wife, Suzanne, and his three children, and they come to Milwaukee. And that really um, is the beginning of, of the rest of this journey that we're going to talk about here. So I mentioned that he did do some work in bronze, but really at the heart of everything Adolf did was this idea of everyday moments. You know, the, the, those fleeting moments that we experience kind of as we're rushing from one event to another and don't really think about, but that's when life happens, those fleeting quick glances and the human condition as well. Um, Adolf, when he created, wasn't about uh, really replicating what someone looked like or a scene looked like, but really capturing, he liked to say, the aura of a person, their characteristics or the, you know, the, the character of the scene happening here. So um, here we have a, a couple individuals working on a car, someone uh, in the trunk there, someone underneath. And again, even in the bronze, which, you know, doesn't lend itself as, as much to being able to, you know, see that contextualness and, and you know, the, the molding. But even here, you can see that kind of impressionistic approach. It's almost like these, you know, gestural strokes that are happening here in the, with the bronze. So Adolf literally... I mean, not only he worked from life, but literally worked from life. <laughs> so he would take clay everywhere he went. He felt that was the best way to be able to capture those, you know, those fleeting moments that we would never think that necessarily is would be the subject of, of a major work. So he used to like to work at restaurants. Um, the family lived on the east side, the studio uh, was on Bartlett Street. He used to frequent beans and barley. Um, he frequented Benji's, which we'll, we'll talk about as well. Um, certainly the uh, Oriental Pharmacy Drugstore, which we'll talk about as well. But, but he was a community man and he captured his community. And he was all about the interactions. Um, and I think that's so fitting when we talk about collection stories and artifacts being imbued with stories, um, because that literally was how Adolf approached his creation. His process really couldn't be separated from the final work. It was about that process of interacting, of capturing that moment. So I, just, I, I think it's it's just great that he's, you know, here he is at a restaurant amid the, uh, the condiments here with his clay sculpting away. So uh, we started off with a picture of my balcony. So here is a close up and this is in clay. And these are all individual pieces. So this is, there's uh, an underlying structure 
And each one of these figures within a chair, the individual chairs um, are separate and, and mobile, but it's just an amazing picture, an amazing snapshot of kind of that, again, that everyday moment. You know, you can see all these little conversations happening, you know, heads kind of coming together and whispering, you know, the gesture of someone kind of waiting anxiously for the film to start. We have a couple in the in the foreground who's uh, got a little PDA going on. <laughs> um, and you probably recognize some of the people here because he filled his work with the people that surrounded him, the people that he loved, um, his wife, his children, uh, colleagues. And in fact, so I wanna show you a little couple close-ups here, just to give you an idea of the tremendous detail. You know, you, you can almost see Adolf's, you know, fingerprints and, you know, as he's working in the clay, you, you can see that kind of unfinished roughness that that really speaks to that the the capturing of, of the gesture um the way he's you know he's not finished these or smoothed these you know left those kind of rougher edges and and not um you know not smoothed everything out that all speaks to kind of capturing that that fleeting moment so adolf wanted to in fact be in this piece in the oriental uh movie theater balcony, but he didn't want to, um, to do himself. He didn't want to create himself. So he asked a colleague to do it. So here we have uh, Adolf with his arms crossed, sitting next to his good friend, um, Benji, who was, of course, um, the namesake of the deli on Oakland Avenue. There's another one uh, over in Fox Point, but um, an establishment, a, a haunt for, you know, community and uh, they were dear friends. And I love that uh, the two of them are sitting here together sharing a moment. So I wanted to show a little bit about, uh, you know, his process here. So Adolf actually created this while he was, you know, working at UWM. This was a project he was doing. So this gives you an idea of, you know, his process. Here he is. He, you know, the pieces were sculpted and then he would come in with acrylic and really his approach in using paint and color um, not only came from that early uh, exposure to abstract expressionism, but certainly to his work with Joseph Albers. So here we can see the, the pre-painted pieces and, and the joy on Adolf's face, which was really always there. He was just um, always smiling, always encouraging, loved to give compliments, loved to encourage his students. He was a beloved professor at UWM for the 33 years that he was there. So we mentioned earlier one of his haunts. Um, and many of you probably remember, it's no longer there, but on the corner of uh, North Avenue in Farwell, um, next to the movie theater there, used to be the Oriental drugstore, the Oriental Pharmacy drugstore. And they had a lunch counter there that had regulars that came all the time. And this was kind of really just the element, the place for Adolf, whether you think about it. All of these little conversations taking place, the cross-section of humanity. You've got you know, lawyers and doctors sitting next to artists and construction men and, you know, the waitresses and staff who were there for decades and had relationships with the patrons that would come in. Um, it was often said that, you know, this was such a second home for people that often they might go away from for vacation and before going back to their homes, they'd come into the pharmacy to the to the lunch counter to announce their having come home. So again, we have a lot of uh, people from his life that are pictured here. Um, give you a little bit of detail uh, facing with his back to us in the yellow jacket with the motorcycle is uh, Michael Davidson. <laughs> Apropos with the uh, motorcycle on the back there. Um, and again, look at the color, the layering, the detail in the interaction, the facial expressions. 
the positioning of these figures. This is the human condition. These are those moments that happen all the time and Adolf captured them. Um, the, the longtime cook uh, here whose hands are enlarged, which really reflects the, you know, his, his labor and uh, working, you know, with food and skillets and pans all day. And Hi Eglish, the longtime owner of uh, the Oriental Pharmacy, the Oriental Drugstore here. And you, you can't see it from this vantage point, but um, this is kind of an early precursor to another series we're going to look at. Um, he's reading a newspaper and he's reading a story and the subject of the story is actually coming out dimensionally uh, towards high. So you can't really see it here, but we'll, we'll look at that concept a little bit more. Um, another building that some people may remember. Um, so the uh, Gay Gardens restaurant here. If this looks to you like um, it's a significantly heavy work, it is. I will tell you that um, Adolf's works were tremendously uh, weighty. <laughs> and uh, this was probably one of the heaviest and getting this position was, was a challenge, but so well worth it. Um, you get this outside view. And then on the back side, there's a, you know, there's, this is a Chinese restaurant. The detail of the people inside So um, again, kind of capturing the human condition, people not idealizing them in, in any way. Um, Adolf's parents had retired to Miami, to Florida. And uh, so it became a family tradition to um, load everyone up and, and fly to Miami. And uh, we have stories from the uh, adult children who are all artists, uh, writers in their own right, um, entrepreneurs. And they would be, they would have to carry the clay onto the plane <laughs> so that Adolf could take it with him and work. So this is a piece called Snowbirds. So here we have this kind of elderly, you know, Jewish population that is uh, resting, relaxing in the sun the colors kind of very washed out, that kind of pastel that we would associate with Miami. Everyone's kind of snoozing or relaxing or, or reading. Look at the detail again here. This woman in the, the foreground with this kind of plaid suit reading. Um, but again, not idealizing the, the man behind, behind her kind of you know nodding off a little bit. Um, and these are all people that are kind of obviously unique individuals that he's sculpting, but universal as well. I mean, we've all, we all have people like these in our lives, or we know people. We recognize them. We resonate with these people. You know, we can connect with them. And, and again, that's all about what Adolf was all about, connections. So um, the other one of the other great series that he did was with New York Times newspapers. Um, he would, you can see the, the papers on the wall behind him, and this is actually at the uh, studio space at UWM. And he would, you know, look at these significant historical events, whether it was political or um, global, what have you, and he would often take the major headlines and pull the stories out into the viewer's space. So one of the pieces that is on display at the Milwaukee County Historical Society is, um, is this piece right here. Um, and this is the New York Times headline of when the Berlin Wall came down. And you have all these immigrants from the East flooding to the West and they are in your space. So here, here's kind of a, a close up of that. Again, you get this kind of 
idea that these are all individuals, but with the mass going on there and this this kind of frenzy, you feel the energy, you feel the rush of you know this having been you know forced to stay on one side of a, a wall and now being able to break through that and all the possibilities. You can just feel that energy there. There's another close up. So one of the other pieces, and I think this might be the last uh, as far as Adolf, um, this is another piece that's uh, on display at the Milwaukee County Historical Society. And one of the other places that Adolf used to love to go to sculpt uh, was the old Milwaukee County Stadium. He used to love to go to the Brewer games. Again, he'd take the kids, they'd take the clay, and Adolf would be in the bleachers studying these people. Um, and capturing this, this amazing moment. And again, this kind of just really speaks so much to the fact that he was the, you know, he was a community person. He, um, he used to walk the neighborhood all the time. It, it was uh, in his later years, we, we both lived in Shorewood. I still do, but it was not uncommon. I, I used to joke that I could never go outside without looking across the street and seeing Adolf walking. Um, but you know everything from the people to the East Side bungalow houses to these you know iconic haunts, um, they were all part of this experience and this world that Adolf created and shared with us. And how extraordinary that he created so many pieces and that we have them to share with future generations. Um, especially at a time like this right now when we're all feeling so isolated, this idea of connection um, and human interaction and those everyday special moments is such a joy to experience. So we are now gonna switch over to talk about Jack Marcus, just a dear individual who I had the privilege of getting to know. Um, so we don't have a lot of images of, of Jack's story because his really his story is about what he shared orally. We have a we have a couple of artifacts to, to represent, um, but it's really about what he left, what he imparted, what he shared. Um, so Jack was. Um, from a small town in Poland. And when the Nazis invaded, his mother made the very difficult decision of shoving some a little bit of food um, supplies into a bag and telling him to run. Um, can't imagine the hardship of telling he, her only child, he was an only child, 15 years old, but she wanted him to have a chance. And so when they invaded, she pushed him out, told him to run, and he hid in a haystack and had to watch as his parents, his family, the rest of the Jews in the town were loaded into trucks that had um, exhaust being piped into the back. Um, he watched in horror as uh, everyone in those trucks was asphyxiated and then dumped into mass graves. Um, can't imagine how alone he had to feel. Um, he knew that labor was the key to survival. Um, he wound up going to several labor camps um, he wound up then being sent to work on the then being, construct being constructed Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. Um, he was doing hard manual labor just to kind of give you an idea of the, the harrowing experiences and, and you know, the, the survival skills that he had, you know, to grasp. Um, at one point he was working with some heavy equipment uh, which fell on his foot and he was very badly injured. He went to the infirmary and basically though he could barely walk, um, he was very aware that if he stayed there longer than a short amount of time, it was certain death for him. 
And so he, you know, again, heavily injured, went back to work. Um, he tells a story of riding on a train, being packed into, you know, train cars with, you know, throngs of other Jewish individuals. What he witnessed as people were, you know, dying on these cars. He uh, shared a story about um, seeing a young boy who was freezing and asked one of the SS guards if he could climb off to get a coat off of one of the bodies. Um, he was given the go ahead and then when he got off was shot in the back. Um, it was really kind of at that point that, that Jack really lost hope uh, for quite a while. Um, it was actually another experience on a train that, that turned that around and brought his humanity back to him. Um, there was, uh, there were some, you know, civilians in the area that, um, very rarely happened, <laughs> but were throwing, um, bread and Jack knew that if he got off the, the, this loaf of bread that he had, I'd had fallen short. He knew if he got off to uh, get that loaf of bread, he would likely be shot, but he, at that point didn't care and uh, went and, and got the bread. Thankfully, as much as you can be thankful for the fact that he, he wasn't killed, he was horribly beaten, um, but threw that bread up to the people on, on that train car. Um, and he talked about that really getting his humanity back. Um, you can see here in this image, this is uh, Jack um, when he was living next door to the Jewish museum at uh, high point, you can see his number tattooed on his arm there. So Jack survived tremendous hardship. Um, one of the things that the Nazis did to try and dwindle populations was to take prisoners on death marches. And Jack had spent time at, at some being moved and doing work at some different camps. He uh, had been at Dachau. And here, um, actually, you can see Jack. If you look, um, the soldier on the left, there's kind of a, there's a rifle that's sticking up. Um, there's a man just behind that rifle. That's Jack Marcus. Um, this was actually a photo that was taken in secrecy by German civilians um, who really, you know, these civilians and uh, didn't offer any kind of assistance. Of course, there was fear of retaliation there too. Um, Jack, again, survived that march. So um, wanted to kind of, you know, this is the, the final picture that, that shows um, the couple of artifacts that are on loan that were provided, really given to the Jewish Museum from um, Jack's family, particularly his daughter, Sharon Lerman. Um, so you have here a FAF Model 60 um, sewing machine and uh, a hat right next to it. So Jack survived the war and um, we know that it was very beneficial if you were a prisoner and you had a skill that could be used. And prior to um, the war, Jack had actually been taught to sew by his grandfather. Um, and if you had a skill that was useful to the Nazis, that really bought you time and saved your life. Um, so this was a life-saving skill for him. And when, um, the camp he was in was liberated uh, by a battalion of American soldiers. Um, they gave him food and in return as a thanks, uh, he provided them with some hats that he had made. Um, and this, this skill became a lifelong profession for him. So uh, 1947, the individual that was born Itzhak, Mark uh, Itzhak Markowski, in uh, 1924, immigrates 
to America, 1947, 1950, he gets to Milwaukee. Here in Milwaukee, he is introduced to a young woman whose family had fleed from the same uh, small town in Poland. Her name is Marlene. Within two months, they uh, were married and they were married for 66 years. Um, but this skill, as I said, became a profession. So he worked as a tailor for 40 years um, and he created things. And uh, this was something that um, supported him and his wife and his family throughout his life. Um, and one of the first things that he bought when he was able to save up enough money was this sewing machine. So uh, really a, a reflection on um, the significance of that skill uh, and how it helped him to not only survive, but to thrive once he uh, came to the United States. So that is where I am gonna end my presentation. You can see that the pieces there are right next to uh, the piece by Adolf of the bleachers that we, we had uh, talked about a little bit earlier. Um, but again, just wanted to end, we talked about Adolf's legacy, Jack's legacy. Um, for many years, he was very reticent to talk about his experience. And after he retired, he realized the importance of sharing his story and really devoted um, his time to speaking with schools, to being part of the Holocaust Education Center's uh, Survivors Bureau, um, spoke to many groups. He understood the importance of sharing his story um, so that what happened would never happen again. And so both of these men um, leave tremendous legacies both in terms of everything that they taught us and shared with us, and again, in terms of these uh, artworks and certainly these artifacts that are imbued with such power and incredible narrative and significance. So uh, I'm gonna wrap it up there and uh, see if we can find John. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's, it's just so interesting to hear. I mean, I think maybe, uh, well, first off I'll say, um, let's, uh, if anybody has any questions, we have some, a few minutes now, um, you can ask, uh, the questions about these stories and, and these artifacts of Molly. Um, but, uh, so just put those in the comments, but let's start with, uh, Jack Marcus's story. Cause that one's the, the one you ended on and just, um, the, the, what a first off a story of perseverance. Um, so my first question is, is I'm guessing you said you have his, um, oral history at the Jewish museum. And do you, is that part of a larger collection that you ha have there? Uh, we, actually, we actually don't have oh, okay. Jack's um, oral history, unfortunately, but um, a lot of the stories that I garnered, um, okay. Jack shared with me personally. Um, also when, uh, when Jack died, um, Meg Jones, who is a terrific reporter for the uh, Milwaukee Journal, did a great story about him. Um, and that allowed me to get some additional information. Meg had spoken with um, Jack's son, Leonard. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Sharon, his daughter, is, is the individual who, um, who provided this artifact to us. Um, and the importance again of, of telling those stories. Um, so while we don't have Jack Marcus's oral history, oral histories are a huge part of what we do at the museum as well. The museum actually grew out of what was uh, the Jewish Historical Society. So one of their main projects was to collect oral histories. And that really started with survivors and then expanded. And that is a project that we've continued um, we have over 550 oral histories. Wow, of, amazing. <laughs> it is amazing and how lucky we are to have those stories. Um, you know, particularly the, the people who, who weren't with us anymore and um, to be able to look back and, and 
glean that information and share those stories. Um, it's such a powerful tool and resource and collection for us to have. And um, as we're kind of going more and more online, so many of us are at this time amid the pandemic, um, one of the things we're really looking to do is digitize more of those oral sure. histories to make them available. Yeah, and what a great picture it paints of uh, the Jewish community in Milwaukee, which leads me to my next question, and that is why did Jack Marcus come to Milwaukee? Like what led him here? You know, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I can't um, I can't definitively tell you. Usually what would happen um, in most cases is that there was a relative or someone that the individual knew um, that were already settled in a particular city um, and could sponsor them. So that likely was the case here, though, again, I, I can't uh, definitively um, tell you who that person might have been or what the circumstances were. And that's something I, I should uh, speak with, with Sharon and uh, Leonard more about so we can add some more to the, the collection and the information surrounding these artifacts. Sure. Um, so switching gears then to, uh, to Adolf Rosenblatt, as far as um, you know, the, all those amazing sculptures and the detail he went into. And I just think it's so cool that he would pick out real people and did you ever hear of somebody not knowing they were in one of his sculptures until they saw it, like at an exhibition? Um, you know, I think that was the case, but a lot of them did know. And that was one of the greatest things about the exhibit was having people come in and pointing out to us, that's me. And, you know, sitting in the movie theater, or that's me sitting at the, the countertop. Um, so we loved hearing those stories. It was what brought things to life. Um, and hearing about those interactions with Adolf, getting a little bit more background, um, particularly hearing about you know some of the people who are featured in the Oriental uh, Pharmacy, the, the lunch counter there, um, Adolf would have them come to his studio and they would have to sit for, you know, two to four hours, they'd have to bring back the same clothes. Wow. Um, so it was really a commitment, but people were so thrilled to be part of the experience. And as I said, so beloved and had such a broad and diverse range of friends and connections in the community. And and all of them are reflected in, in his pieces. It's such a happy looking guy. So just jolly, like you said. He really, really was. He understood um, how fleeting life can be and the importance of recognizing those, those moments when you know the rest of us are kind of passing our time waiting to get from the one big thing to the next mm -hmm. while you know all the great stuff is happening in between and uh and he really understood that and not only did he capture that he was all about you know when he was out walking or he's at one of you know beans and barley or he's at benji's having those conversations having those interactions um he truly was a, a people person and um and his work reflects that so beautifully. Yeah, they're definitely treasures. Um, to that, that I'm so glad that there's that record of, of his, you know, his existence here in Milwaukee. Uh, we did get some comments, I think, from members of the Marcus family who tuned in. Oh, okay. Um, so there's several of these like this. Uh, Jeremy says uh, Jack Marcus came to Milwaukee to meet his future wife. Okay. Um, okay. So and then Sharon says he received a picture of his wife and came to meet her. So. Um, so, so there it is. There, Thank there you. was a reason to be, there was, yeah, there was a definite reason to be in Milwaukee. <laughs> so I knew that uh, that Jack and, and Marlene had been introduced by cousins. I wasn't aware that uh, that, that was the, the impetus <laughs> for, for the trip. Um, and, uh, and that the, the, the shidduch, <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the connection there and the marriage that wound up happening was, uh, was a result of that. That's terrific. Thank you, Sharon, for uh, yeah. sharing that. <laughs> so he, he, and I'm sure after all he was been through, he was in a hurry. So <laughs> they, right. they're engaged within a week. So that, that sounds about right. Um, <laughs> All right, just a couple questions to wrap up because there's been a few that came through. So I'll go with one that pertains more to the historical society first. Um, from Donna is yes, you can be put on an email list, 
uh, for our future programs. I'm guessing that the Jewish Museum Milwaukee also has an email list. Uh, we do. We do. So you can find ours just by going to milwaukeehistory.net and there's a sign up thing at the top and you can get put on so you can get all our future communications. If you want to pitch your own, uh, Molly, I'm sure it's similar. Yes, if you, uh, you can visit our website at www.jewishmuseummilwaukee.org. Um, we have all kinds of information on our site. Um, if you shoot us an email, there's a, you can shoot a general email to info at jewishmuseummilwaukee.org. And if you're interested in being on our uh, mailing list, our e-blast list, um, finding out about events, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, come to the site and, uh, and join us for some of the things that are coming up and, and yeah. uh, learn more about everything that's happening. All right, so this leads me to the next question. I know we talked about this before, um, and so I know part of this you might, probably don't have an answer to right now, but I think it's also important um, because you, you all are so active on the Jewish Museum uh, Facebook page so for the virtual content, but Nancy's asking, first off, where is the Jewish Museum if, if you haven't been there yet? It's a fantastic museum. I, Terrific I, question. Thank you so and then much. what hours is it open is the big thing that I know you're like, ah. <laughs> so we are actually located uh, in the Milwaukee Jewish Federation building, which is basically on the corner of Prospect and Ogden. Um, we're connected to High Point and then the Jewish home, if, you, if you're familiar with that area. And right at the end of... Um, the hop line. So uh, once we're, we're able to hop again, um, <laughs> that's kind of a convenient way to get to us. So um, we unfortunately are not open right now. Uh, we've taken all the steps to uh, prepare to be able to welcome back members and, and visitors safely. Um, we're watching, you know, the, the trends in terms of what's going on with COVID-19 and uh, you know, we, we hope to be able to welcome back people physically into our doors very soon. Um, so that being said, when that happens, our normal hours um, are Monday through Thursday, uh, 10 until 5, and Sunday from noon until 4. Um, of course, we uh, hopefully once again, once we get back to uh, being able to get together. We have, um, you know, programs that go on in the evenings, on the weekends, but right now that's all happening online. Um, so we're going to continue to provide content just like Milwaukee County Historical Society is doing so wonderfully. Well, I think that, that'll wrap us up for tonight. Um, again, thank you first for loaning us those wonderful items uh, for our exhibit. Um, and second, for sharing the very in-depth stories about uh, why they're so important in, in the first place. Um, I think it gives a, a great uh, insight into into their lives and these objects. So um, that's really, all I've got. It, it's my pleasure. And I, I really, we thank you for the opportunity, not just to, to share these objects and, and artworks um, to have on display there, but uh, to be able to, as you said, get into a little more in depth Mm -hmm. the significance behind them and the incredible narratives and um, and the legacy that's been left for us to to have now and for future generations. Wonderful. Well, uh, everybody out there, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, most important. Um, and uh, again, our next program is a week from today about Milwaukee's socialist uh, history. Um, and so just uh, keep an eye out. You can join the email list. You won't miss it. Um, but uh, just keep an eye out on our Facebook page. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be uh, updating you as to all that stuff. But it's a week from today, same time. Um, and then when is your next uh, Museum Moments talk, Molly? So our Museum Moments, thank you again uh, for a shout out there, um, happen every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 o'clock. So uh, there was one today. There'll be another one on Thursday. Uh, we also have a great series called Conversation Starters, where we do interviews with um, people from all backgrounds uh, across not only the city state, but uh, the world. So that's another great thing to tune into. Um, again, just visit the website and get a great schedule of all those activities. Cool. Awesome. Well, everybody have a good weekend and uh, we uh, will see you on all these platforms hopefully next week. All right. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.